I think so. I think we can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if people want to put themselves on mute so that we don't get any feedback, that would be fantastic. Um, so I'm Liz. I'm the manager of the Guernsey Biological Record Centre, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about Guernsey's um, amazing sea. So first of all, I'm going to share my screen. So you should all uh, share the computer sound. Right, can everyone see a lovely picture with fish that says everything plankton? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Indeed, yeah. okay, so what is plankton? Um, oh, my computer is not moving fast. There we go. So plankton actually has a really broad definition you literally have to meet two things to qualify as plankton. First of all, you need to live in the pelagic zone. So that's the open ocean or the water column. And secondly, you need to be transported by the ocean currents. So, and in fact, the word plankton comes from the Greek, which means wanderer or drifter. But because this is such a broad definition, it means lots of things you might not think of plankton actually qualify. So jellyfish can be defined as plankton too. So if we're talking small things all the way up to jellyfish, what does that actually mean for what we think of as real plankton? So real plankton, plankton can be all the way down in the nanometer scale, so 10 to the minus 9. Or as a jellyfish, they can be up to meters in size. But on average, plankton is into the micrometer size. So that's 10 to the minus 6 or 1,000th of a center uh, of a millimeter and there are two types of plankton so we have zooplankton which are microscopic animals and we have phytoplankton which are microscopic plants and you get plankton in the ocean but you also get it in fresh water um, and here we've got two sort of general assemblages so in the fresh water you can see that we've got things like diatoms and algae and dinoflagellates. And then if we look at the marine uh, 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 assemblage, we, we've actually got the same thing. I mean, some of the diatoms are different. So you have a Catocera species rather than a Tablarina, a Renichia species, but you've still got the same things happening. So you have the dinoflagellates in fresh water and you have them in salt water. Um, now, I could talk, there's so many species of, diet, of, of phytoplankton, I could talk about them for hours, but I'm not going to. I'm going to break it down to the five main groups. So the five main groups are cyanobacteria. So that is actually bacteria that photosynthesizes like a plant. Um, you have diatoms, which are, I've got some like clicking going on. People, people mind if I mute you? Um, so you have diatoms, which are uh, microscopic plants, and they make their little home out of silicon. Dinoflagellates can be both plants, and then some of the others are dinoflagellates are heterotrophs, so they eat other plants and animals. You also get green algae, so microscopic green algae, and algae goes all the way up to include the seaweeds like kelp, kelp off the coast, you know, they're massive, and the final group are um, plankton that is made, that, that make their home out of calcium carbonate or chalk and they're coccolithophores. So these are tiny little plants. Are they really that important? Yes, yes they are. So this picture was taken last summer, the 23rd of June, and it shows a phytoplankton bloom. So all of this sort of turquoise cloud shape 
that is billions upon billions of microscopic plants. So just like in the spring when you go out into your garden and suddenly all the plants are in bloom, that's exactly what's happening here. And these blooms can be small or they can be like this one where we can see it from space. They can last for hours or days or weeks or even months and they're happening all the time all the way around the world. This particular bloom is probably mainly made up of um, Emiliani Huxii, so that's the little image in the bottom corner there, and that's five micrometers that scale, which means five thousandths of a millimeter. And this is a really important coccolithophore, a really important plant, because if you look at the cliffs of Dover, the white cliffs of Dover, are made of chalk, they're actually made of billions and billions of these fossilized these. They're a hugely important part of our ocean. Um, so what Phyto, the reason phytoplankton is so important is just like plants on land, they float, and well, plants on land don't float generally, but phytoplankton float near the ocean surface and they turn sunlight and carbon dioxide into sugars and oxygen, just like land plants. And then these plants become food for the grazing zooplankton, shellfish, and then what we think of as typical fish of the ocean. They also play a really important part in the global carbon cycle. They take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they sink it to the bottom of the ocean. So by now, I think everyone can understand that they're really important. So it is slightly concerning that at the record centre, we have zero records of the plankton in our ocean we, around Guernsey. We know they're there because if they weren't there, we wouldn't have any marine life at all but we have absolutely no records. So I couldn't tell you what's in our ocean right now. What I can do is tell you some broad facts about phytoplankton. So 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water and the phytoplankton create between 50 and 85% of the oxygen we breathe. That's a really big, um, number range and the reason for that is because well we can go into the lab and we can work out how much oxygen one of these plants can produce we don't actually know how many of these plants are in the ocean because of that bloom situation so they're going on all the time for different lengths of time different sizes so unless we know every single bloom that's happening all the time and what species we can't accurately say how much of the oxygen we breathe is being produced by the ocean. So the conservative estimate is 50%. So there's also a huge diversity in the different species. The phytoplankton and zooplankton combined mean that we've got about 5,000 different species of plankton identified so far. But at the same time, we've also got concerns because there's been a 40% decrease in plankton since the 1950s. I'm gonna pause talking about the microscopic plants, the phytoplankton for a moment, and go back to the zooplankton. So just like I showed you before with the fresh and salt water, you have zooplankton in both fresh water and marine water. And there is a huge diversity in the number of microscopic animals. In the fresh water, we can see that there are things like water fleas, um, ostracods, copepods, um, and something that I can't pronounce, so I'm not going to, um, and then in the marine um, zooplankton group, we have tintinids, um, copepods, and we also have things like common jellyfish, um, comb, jellyfish comb jellies, and ketognaths, which are a predatory marine worm. So what's really cool, well, it's not cool, um, it's interesting. We don't actually know how many animal species there are in the ocean because new ones are found all the time. In fact, earlier this year, a new species of whale was identified. So if we're missing something as large as a whale, when we get down to the microscopic level, it's not surprising we're not sure, we don't know how many different species there are. And what's even cooler about zooplankton is that they only make up 2% of the animals in the water, 98% of animals in the water live on the seafloor or on hard surfaces. Only 2% live in this free, flo free floating form. Now, 
I thought you might like to see some real examples. Zooplankton aren't just things like copepods. There are a lot of other species that start off as plankton and then later in life become something else. So number one is a barnacle larvae. All barnacles start off their life drifting in the plankton and they have two uh, larval stages. The first is this one, it's called a nauplius and then it molts just like a crab um, and then goes, well several molts, and then it goes into a stage called a cypress stage and then finally it becomes an adult. Once an adult it will attach to a rock or uh, a boat or seaweed or whatever. Um, but it starts its life as plankton. Number two is one of my favourite pictures because they look like tiny little snowflakes, but they're actually baby starfish, echinoids, starting off their life from the plankton. Number three, this is um, uh, uh, a plant, this is a phytoplankton, it's foraminifera. It makes this beautiful spiral shell out of calcium carbonate. Um, and so each chamber, as the animal, well, as the creature grows, it makes a new chamber. And it can use, it can fill these chambers with gas to go up and down the water column. So it can go up in the day for the sunlight and down at night. And number four is a ketognath. So this was in the zooplankton assemblage on the previous slide, and it's a predatory marine worm. And what this, you don't need a microscope to identify. That worm, the whole worm, is 10 centimetres in size, so you definitely don't need a microscope. And what look like lovely little feathers are in fact, it's jaws. It looks more like something out of a horror movie, which when you find out that it's a voracious predator that eats lots of other zooplankton, it makes perfect sense. And in fact, it's so aggressive that it will even target small fish. There are lots of other things that live in the plankton at some point. So all of our ormers, so our ormers breed in the summer in late August, September, and the, the, the new ormers start off as plankton. For about five or six days they are part of the plankton uh, community before going down to the seafloor and starting to molt and actually look like ormers. Stalked jellyfish start off as plankton but then when they get to adult size, they, just like the barnacles, will settle and find somewhere to attach, which they will stay for the rest of their life. Hopefully by now, you've got an indication that plankton are really cool and they're really important, but not all plankton are good. Dinoflagellates and diatoms. So there's about 2,000 species of dinoflagellate, and of that 2,000, 60 species make complete toxins. Diatoms also can produce some nasty stuff. The three, four species listed there are ones that fisheries around the world will check for in um, uh, catches because these are species that can make us sick. Most phytoplankton are harmless to animals, but these species can produce toxic or poisonous chemicals. Um, and the effects range from diarrhea to paralysis, dizziness, memory loss and in extreme circumstances you can die. Now the reason that these tiny little things can actually make us sick is because shellfish like clams and mussels and oysters actually eat by filtering out zooplankton and phytoplankton from the water and when they eat these algae, uh, these toxic algae, the poisons then start to build up in the flesh of the uh, shellfish so if humans then, or animals, then eat that shellfish, they get sick. And this is the what's behind, well, when I was a child, people say you only eat shellfish in a month with an R in it. And the reason for that is um, these species tend to bloom in the summer in months where there isn't an R. So the dinoflagellates are responsible for red tides. And you don't tend to get them in the winter. So that's why the saying used to be only eat shellfish with an R in the month. Farm shellfish have to have that are um, grown under extremely strict conditions and they're constantly testing and checking to make sure there are none of these species. So any farm shellfish, by the time it gets to the grocery, uh, to the supermarket or whatever, it will have been tested and it will, the chance of you getting sick are extremely unlikely. 
but it's not just shellfish that can uh, get, have problems with these toxic algae. Um, zooplankton eat the microscopic plants. So just like the shellfish, the poisons can build up in them. <laughs> and then the fish eat the zooplankton and then they get sick and die. Um, and um, if there's enough uh, of these killer algae, the chemical or chemicals are very toxic. That's when you get hundreds of fish dying and washing from the shore. Um, it seems to happen more in fresh water, simply because if you get an unexpected bloom, it can quickly use up all the oxygen in the fresh water and then you have a mass death. Um, I've got a list of all the nasty different ways these things can affect us, but I, I think I've dwelt on it long enough, so I'm going to move on. They can also be non-natives. In the last few years, we've had um, the Asian hornet, that's an invasive non-native species, and it's being, um, there's a team and we're trying to stop them from setting up shop uh, in Guernsey. But the same thing can happen with plankton. So this picture is of Coscanodiscus wallacei, and it is a huge phytoplankton, a huge plant, and it, it's lovely, lovely and round, but it also forms these chains. And what I love about this picture is that you can see these massive Coscanodiscus, but you can also see a copepod. So normally copepods would be eating this sort of species, but it's not a native species and it's large and apparently it doesn't taste very nice. So our native zooplankton aren't eating them, which might not seem like a big deal until you realize that that gives this species of phytoplankton an advantage over our native species. Um, part of the issue is that Phytoplankton are so small, and actually, because they're microscopic, if they're a new species, it's quite difficult to notice that they're there. And in fact, often you don't notice until they get to be in large enough numbers to be a real problem. And by which point, there's usually not very much you can do about it. It also means we don't have a huge amount of data about when non-native species arrive in locations. Um, with this particular one, it was first detected off Plymouth in 1977, but we have no idea if it was introduced by accident or if it came here because of warming waters or what. I'm going to talk now about a particular group of phytoplankton, um, and I'm doing this specifically because it's my favourite group. These are diatoms. They are incredibly beautiful little plants and they make their home or their shell or their test out of silica glass. So the picture directly under the title diatoms is a picture taken through a microscope using normal light. And then the picture to the side is using polarized light. So in the normal light, it's pretty interesting. But if you look at the polarizing light, you can suddenly see all of these structures that were invisible before. Um, I love these. Uh, I, I used to work in Antarctica and I worked with diatoms. And diatoms can be found in the ocean. They can be found in fresh water. You can find them at the top of mountains in the snow and in icebergs and ice sheets. So these channels of hypersaline brine and you get diatoms that are specifically adapted to live in them. This group underpins the entire Antarctic ecosystem. It's the main source of food for krill, um, which is the main source of food for penguins, for the humpback whales, and they're a hugely important carbon sink. So when they photosynthesize, they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they create oxygen, and then when a zooplankton or a penguin or a whale eats them, that carbon then goes into the larger animal. And then when you have fecal pellets, they float down to the bottom of the ocean and that carbon is then locked away for a thousand years. With whales, it's even more cool because the krill eats the diatoms that can get eaten by the whales. And in the Southern Ocean, there isn't enough iron in the water so when the whales produce their, they, and they produce a slurry rather than um, solid fecal matter, they 
reintroduce that iron back into the water and then you get a phytoplankton bloom and the whole thing starts again. But I'm not going to talk for hours about that, even though I very easily could. I'm going to show you some pictures of Antarctic diatoms that I took. So we've got a nice selection here. The number one is um, we never actually identified it in the end. It's either a centric diatom or a pheocystis colony, which is lots of sort of um, tiny little potato-like things all glumped together. The second picture is Astero and Phallus. And I love this because it looks like a starfish. It's got that, um, that five symmetry. These two are both quite large. The next one, number three, is a um, uh, diatom. Number four is a silica flagellate, and they, they are just stunning. Um, diatoms can form chains. So number five is a chain of Fragilariopsis cardiolensis. Um, if you look at it from the end, it's a roundish, squished, squished round diatom, and they form these huge chains. Number six is a, a Nietzsche species, Pseudonychia. So this is the group that the, po uh, the poisons, that the toxic um, diatoms belong to. And they form chains too. You can just see at the end, each cell, each needle-like cell is kind of sticking on top of the next one. Um, number seven and number eight are both tintinids and they're a zooplankton. They may have this little sort of funnel-shaped house um, and they're all tucked up in, in number seven and then their tentacles come out to feed in number eight. I've talked a lot about different plankton but you can actually get involved in plankton research if that's something you're interested in because there are incredible projects and rather than talk about this I'm actually going to play you a video from the Secchi Disc study. Living at the surface of the sea scientists believe that it's the warming of the surface of the ocean due to climate change that has caused the decline in phytoplankton around the world. The phytoplankton, not only do they underpin the marine food chain, but through the process we call photosynthesis, which is the process they use to grow, the byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. And the phytoplankton are so numerous in the seas around the world that they produce 50% of the oxygen in the air we breathe. They also, by removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they help regulate our climate. The phytoplankton consume about 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every day. Scientists looking at phytoplankton over the last 100 years have shown that in the last 50 years they've declined by about 40% globally. Now that means there's 40% less production at the base of the marine food chain. Sailors can help us study the phytoplankton using a very simple piece of equipment and it's called a secchi disc. A secchi disc is a round white disc, 30 centimetres in diameter. It can be made from any material. This one that we're using today is made from five millimetre foamex. You attach a tape measure and a hang a weight below so that the disc sinks vertically in the water. You lower the disc into the water from the side of a boat and you watch it disappear from sight. And you record the depth below the surface at which you can no longer see the disc. And that's called the Secchi depth. The Secchi depth tells us about the clarity of the seawater. The shallower the depth, the more cloudy the water. The deeper the Secchi depth, the more clear the water. Away from estuaries and coasts, the main determinant of water clarity is the phytoplankton. And so the Secchi depth is a very good way of measuring the amount of phytoplankton in the water column. And then, using a mobile app called Secchi, which is a free app for iPhones, Android phones, and Windows phones, you can record the Secchi depth. The first thing you do with the app is you take the GPS location where you measure the depth. And then you enter the Secchi depth, and then the app stores the data until you get back to land. And then you can send it off to a database. And it will become part of the largest citizen science study of the plankton in the world. I'm yachtswoman Susie Goodall and the seafaring ambassador for this.
Psychedus study. The plankton at the sea surface are our constant companions. They bring life to the sea and the Psychedus study is a great way any seafarer can help understand them better. So take part and help us learn more about the sea. You can measure the Seki depth wherever you are, whether you're travelling from place to place or if you only sail locally, you may want to set up a sample site. Next time you go to sea, have a Seki disc with you, take the Seki depth and you'll leave an ocean legacy for future generations. And what's really cool about this project is that you can see all the data points on their website. So I went to their website at the end of February and had a look at the Channel Islands and we've got two recordings um, and none for Guernsey. So the record centre actually now has a Seki disc. So if people want to borrow it, they're more than welcome to. Um, I'll talk to Anna, maybe I can get it put down at the Yacht Club or something. Um, and it, but it'd be so good to actually get some data for Guernsey because the channel lines are really interesting and there's very few places in the world that have the conditions that we have so it'd be really cool to find out a bit more about us. Um, so I've kind of taken the brief of plankton and sort of run a bit further with it. We said that jellyfish technically qualify so I wanted to talk just a tiny bit about jellyfish because I think they're really, really cool. Um, the wildlife trusts produce a huge amount of um, information, pictures and things for people to go out and, and, and learn a bit more about our wildlife. And they've produced this thing called a jelly detective. And these are all the species that you find around the British Isles. And you find all of them here in Guernsey, except the lime rain jellyfish, which is a good thing because it's really venomous. Um, but of the other nine, not all of them are technically jellyfish. So the coon jelly is actually a, seten a setenophore, and the by the wind sailor and the Portuguese man of war are, are colonial hydroids. So those two are both a collection of highly specialized um, individual animals that live together. The coon jelly isn't a jellyfish because it doesn't have any stinging cells. Instead, it's got something called a colobla called coloblasts, which are sticky cells, and they use them to trap prey by sort of squirting glue onto them. They're voracious predators, and they're also cannibals. They'll eat other coon jellies. I've got a really cool video on Twitter about it, and I might see if I can pop it on Facebook for people to have a look at. Um, but all the rest are jellyfish, and they technically qualify as plankton, apart from the stalked jellyfish, which is only plankton when it's juvenile. Um, so let's have a look. I've got a bit more about large fish, but I realise I've been talking for half an hour, so I don't know if people have questions, because um, I'm uh, I'm guessing this is a 40 minute um, meeting. Anyone got questions? Chris, you're on mute, I think, if you're going to ask. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello. Hello, Liz. It's lovely to hear this. Um, I was talking with Anna a few weeks ago, um, well, I think before the last attempt at the talk, and I had the privilege. I'm no yachty, believe you me, and I'll set the tone very humbly. I was in the middle of the night at about one o'clock in the morning, not all that far from the French coast, because we were heading for Douarnenez with luckily a sailing ship, so no engine noise, nothing. And suddenly the sea lit up. And I've noticed one of your species is called Noctiluna. But it was just like a, almost a sort of, de well, not quite daylight, but, and then the next lovely surprise was that a whole pod of about six or more dolphins joined us because obviously it was, you know, drawing the food, you know, it was food to draw them in. So I got everyone on board up to watch this and it went on for several hours. It was absolutely the, one of the most memorable experiences of my life. Unfortunately, it was so long ago, we didn't have all the techie stuff to photograph things, but I don't know if any efficient filming would have gone on, but anyway. No, it was, it was wonderful. I know exactly what you mean. Um, yeah. So when I was talking about the toxic species, 
the dyne, you get toxic dinoflagellates, but you also get bioluminescence um, dinoflagellates. Yes. And they, 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 for us, just as you've described, and it's often this brilliant blue, it looks like you've wandered into a fairy tale. Um, and in the summer, actually around Guernsey shoreline, sometimes that um, bioluminescent gl uh, glow will come right up to the shoreline because the, the, the plankton are right in the shallows. Mm -hmm. And it, it is truly something special. You're really, really fortunate to have seen it. I'm so <laughs> envious. No, it was, it was extraordinary. I mean, do, does plankton um, go and look for its own um, what would I call it, sort of location, abode, or is it just tidally drawn to certain places, or what? It, it literally floats with the currents. Um, okay. And, the, and some species that you will find all over the world, and some that are mm. adapted to colder water, and some to warmer water. Because mm. I sometimes work with fisheries, only as a mere translator. That's another old story, and talk about diplomatic links, ha ha. But yes, it's all interesting if it does flourish around here, whichever, you know, food planktons there are, yes, yeah. I would love to get a plankton net and go out and do some sampling, but mm. the record centre is sort of all biological data. So unless um, we can make a decent business case at the moment, it's, this is something that would be lovely to do in the future um, and it's, it's important for, uh, to monitor the toxic ones um, obviously because of shellfish um, so at the moment the only monitoring is if uh, visiting scientists or research groups come here. Well that would be a thought it's all worth sharing information really yeah absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hi Liz, can you hear me? I can. Hi, oh, it's Chris. Yeah, two questions really. Do you have grill in these waters? And the second question is, what effect does, well, there's a lot of publicity about mercury and the awful effect that having, and how does that impinge on the work that you're doing? I didn't quite hear your first question. What was your first question? Right. Do we have krill in Guernsey waters? So we have shrimp, but krill itself is an, Anto is Anto an Antarctic species. So we have, but they are yeah. a, a, a type of amphibian, a, a shrimp. Um, so um, we, we've got local shrimp and so on. Uh, we just don't have krill. With mercury, mercury is more of a concern for larger animals particularly things like dolphins, because it builds up in the bottom. They're at the top of the food chain, so that every level you go up, you concentrate all the nasty stuff. Um, and with um, cetaceans, the, the big issue is that the females reduce their mercury because it goes in um, the milk when they feed their young, but in male cetaceans, it builds up over the course of their life, and that can have effects uh, on fertility, um, on behaviour, on general health. Uh, the same with um, the predatory fish like swordfish and tuna. Again, you get that concentration um, of mercury. Okay. Thank you. Such a glory for plankton. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, just a chippy question. Talking of Antarctica, do you know Joe Arend here in Guernsey? Yes, and every time we plan to meet up, something goes wrong. Last time we had a pandemic, so I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> a, a good bit, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> she's absolutely phenomenal. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah, I've seen, I've I heard her speak on various topics, mainly through the French circle, because we're all members of that anyway. You know, she we have a, to talk to each other. Yeah, <laughs> she did a fantastic talk about um, melatonin and the effects of. Um, yeah. s s at, uh, the 24-hour daylight on human sleeping patterns. Uh, she did a talk. True, another another story <laughs> there. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I can't really know and ask you when you were down in um, Antarctica. Were you working for Bass or some somebody else? So at the time. Um, Channel Island residents weren't eligible for UK scientific funding, so I actually went with Germany. Oh, okay. 
Good. My husband <laughs> and I, well, we were down there for 18 months working with Bass, so that's quite interesting. I'll um, um, send, you, send you an email. <laughs> and um, we I'm did, uh, yeah. And we've just come back, actually, last year from a trip down there. And interesting about the killer whales, because they change colour. Yes, in yeah. fact, I should mention that because yeah, it's really song. interesting. Yeah, On the I'll let, let you. I'll let you talk. <laughs> oh no, no, no. So the the killer whales in Antarctica are black and pale yellow because they get diatoms on their skin, and diatoms are these microscopic plants. And so when they're photosynthesizing, they look yellow. So the killer whales look yellow. And then when the killer whales migrate back up north. Um, you get the temperature change in the water and the diatoms either die or fall off and then they go back to being black and white. Um, yeah. Any so can questions? anybody, sorry, can, can anybody apply for one of these discs um, or, yeah. So, so we've so got we just one. Go on the website and get one. So you can make them, um, or you can get them from the Secudis project. I think they're about thirty pounds. Um, mm. So we got one because I, I, for some reason, I thought that I was going to be able to go out on the sea last year um, and do some measurement, which never happened. Um, but we're more than happy for people to borrow this. Um, and yeah, as I said, you can make your own, or you can um, get one from the Secudis project. I think we might have to have an evening at the yacht club making some. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like it'd be fun. Oh, why not? Yeah. So, Duff. Talking of, you mentioned whales as well. I did, this is a little bit surreal. I'll try and cut a long story short, but frankly and freely, we buried a friend at sea at the casket. And as we came back into St. Peterport, we were aboard the Bon Marin de Serre there was a mass of people and suddenly I saw this sleek back in the water and I said oh look dolphins just to be a bit you know cheer people up or something no it wasn't it was a pilot whale oh. so it was really quite a surprise and I told somebody or other I think it must have been at Frossard House whatever department it was and they logged it on the radar but I haven't seen any since but I don't get out that much <laughs> Because they can stay further out, we don't, have, we don't get many records, but we do have pilot whales and fin whales and say whales. Um, okay. And of course, in 2016, we had that humpback whale that was very lost, um, that was seen around Jersey and Albany. Um, what's been really interesting in this lockdown is how many whale and dolphin sightings we've had. So last year, I think we had something like three sightings in February, and this year we've had more than 14, and I think three different species. So that's really exciting. So they come more um, prolifically because of the peace and quiet or because there's better feeding here or what? I think it's probably a little bit of both. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, you you will all know much better than me because you are very aware of the currents around here, but effectively we're, we're sort of like a funnel from the channel um, and that brings in plankton and fish and we're also much quieter than the English Channel. Um, and some of our dolphins hate marine noise. So, um, well, exactly. Absolutely, absolutely hate it. So, um, yeah, I, I think all of these things are why we're seeing more and more of them. So there can be good, some good drawn from all this mess at the moment. <laughs> In fact, yeah. what the, the cool, I keep saying the coolest and then say something else that's also the coolest, but um, uh, a, a solitary male Rizzo dolphin was seen in February. So Rizzos are family, they make family groups, and the fact that this was a large male on his own means that he could be scouting for new territory. So every mm -hmm. August, we get a pod of Rizzos that come in. We don't know where they're from. We've sent the pictures to the Isle of Man because they've got over 500 Rizzos and it would make sense for them to be coming here. But yeah, so exciting times. Maybe we'll get more Rizzo dolphins. Yeah, so it's always, there's always some purpose in a cock up, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think that's a brilliant attitude to take. Mm -hmm. There's always something good that can happen. Yep, yep. 
that's what I meant really. I don't know. Any other questions? It doesn't have to be about plankton. <laughs> I appreciate that, uh, that it's not everyone's cup of tea. Liz, uh, Andy here. You mentioned earlier uh, some sage about some hypo or super saline um, seawater in, in Antarctica. How's that created? So How's when, it developed? Yeah, so when, when the, the temperature gets so cold that the sea itself starts to freeze, the salt in the seawater is pushed out. So it's actually just pure fresh water that makes icebergs or pancake ice um, um, or and so as the water is pushed out around the edge as the body of ice gets bigger and bigger it can't necessarily get out and so it creates these cracks and channels where it's hyper saline and you'll get diatoms living in there that especially in that yeah. cool. and they don't cool. freeze yeah. right but the water or the saline there prevent that 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 drop of water from or that that section of water from freezing wouldn't it so yeah it'll make channel a channel all the way through and then go out yeah. underneath um underneath the iceberg or the ice sheet mm. Very good. and actually below an iceberg or an ice sheet there will be you get these incredibly large communities of um diatoms uh, and other plankton and i now, this is where I, I might be talking complete rubbish. I have a feeling that there are types of diatoms that will actually live within the ice itself, but oh, really? don't, don't quote me on that. Wow. Liz, can I ask another one? <clears throat> you know, whales sort of you know, eat a lot of krill, but do they also, are they able to sort of handle um, plankton as well through their baleen things? Or? Yes, yes, exactly. So they'll they'll take yeah. in the phytoplankton as well as the as well as the krill, um, and um, the krill are bright red because of the amount of iron in them. Um, so, yeah, being a little bit basic, um, uh, if you go to Antarctica, you will see all of these ice sheets covered in red. And um, mm. when I was there, my initial thought was, oh my goodness, a leopard seal has eaten a penguin. No, penguins poop bright red because of all the krill in their diet. Mm. Um, but the first time you see it, 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 you do have this momentary, oh, oh, has there been a slaughter here? No, no, just, just penguin poop. Well, the penguins friendly with you? Yes, um, they're not scared mm. of humans. Um, and you're supposed to keep your distance, and that can be yeah, quite challenging because they'll be like. Well, I asked doing? that because I, I remember years ago, friends of mine who sadly at, at that time were sent to the Falklands, and that was one of the factors that cheered them up no end was how friendly the penguins mm. were. <laughs> so, um, Pelarstern no longer puts down a gangplank onto the ice. You go in a little okay. bucket and you're winched over because the wooden slats on the gangplank were just close enough for the Adelie penguin, the tiny little penguins about this big, to hop up and get onto the ship. And you oh, are no. allowed to touch the penguins. So you have oh, penguins. They were quite adventurous, adventurous, yeah. <laughs> so you then have oh. penguins on your ship and you cannot touch them to get them off. Um, oh, so uh, 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 off the top of my head, you get these huge sort of wooden brooms to clean the, the deck. And so you have the sailors sort of vigorously brushing the deck, trying to encourage the penguins to then leave. And the penguins would just be like, what are you doing? Fortunately, oh. after a couple of hours, they got bored and left. But then the <laughs> gas came up and never went back down. <laughs> oh, sweet. OK. So they learned their lesson. Listen to mummy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think the penguins learned their lesson at all. I think it, it was the decision was made that no one wanted to be in that situation again, and it was easier to just use a bucket than to uh, put down the penguins. Oh dear. All right. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Liz, where are you based around the place? Where, where's your office? Oh. So at the moment, um, I'm working from home, obviously. Um, oh, like you. Uh, like all of us. Um, but we have an office up at Raymond Fowler House. We're not part of the States. But Sorry, which have, house? Raymond Fowler House up in St. Martin. Oh, right. OK, all right. So we're not part of the States, but we work very closely um, with APLANS, the Agricultural mm -hmm. Land Management Department. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, by being based up there, it means we can work more closely and hopefully make things more efficient. Um, and also yes. it's great publishing, which is helpful. <laughs> can work, yes, yes. Questioning them out, Liz. Yeah, I, I think I think so. Um, if anyone thinks of questions later, you're more than welcome to drop us an email or um, pop it on Facebook, um, and I'll do my best to answer. And if I can't, I'll see if I can find someone who can. Thank you. I'd really like to thank you very much, uh, Liz. That was yeah, very that entertaining. Was very lovely. interesting. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very and much. If I, so much. I can remember all the techie words, I'll tell fisheries that you're looking after them too. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we'll get Liz into the yeah. club and uh, we'll do some more. Oh, that would be really great. I'd really like that. Yeah, no, we would. Uh, I think there's lots of um, lots of things we can uh, help each other with on this. So uh, it'd be great. Yeah, mm. I think so. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Glad I was well done, Liz. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Should I just finish the meeting? Anna? Yeah, sorry, because you've got control. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs>